This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. You will hear part of a consultation between a GP and a patient called Mrs Brownstone. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Hi Mrs Brownstone, how can I help you today? Hi there Dr Rivers, I'd just like you to do a test on my waters. I've had a few problems recently. Um, I have to go quite a lot more and it's started to burn a little and just been a little bit uncomfortable. I see, how, how long have you had these symptoms for? Well, it's been, sort of goes on and off for um, about three weeks, closer to a month really. Some days it's better than others. I don't take too much notice. I put a lot of it, lot of it down to age, but um, I don't think there's anything really serious, but just wondered. It seems a bit strong at the moment. And uh, have you had this sort of problem before a lot or not? Oh yes, it's happened quite often over the time. Normally just antibiotics clear it up. I'd say I've been treated for this, oh, at least five times in the last ten years. Um, and you've left it for a few weeks before coming in to see me. Do you sometimes get symptoms that come and go like this? Mm, yes, they do. And uh, I just try to drink more, which I'm very bad at, drinking water and such like, but I try. And it, it usually goes. Well, it usually just goes off by itself, really. Okay, and what about night time? How are you at night? Oh, I'm up and down a lot. Three times out in the night at least, every night. And it's, it's more painful at night time, funnily enough. And it's much more urgent. At night there seems to be a lot of pressure. I think it's been going on for such a long time it's becoming normal. Right, OK. Well, that's not something we want you to be getting used to. Let's see what we can do. When you've had these symptoms in the past, you've had the antibiotics, did it calm it down? Mm, yes, antibiotics seem to do the trick. And what about accidents? Any accidents with the waterworks? No, I just have to make sure I get there quickly. Um, I, I do find when I've been sitting for a while, once I get up, I, I've got to go immediately. So, so I always want to know where the loo is, wherever I am. Um, but if you cough, sneeze or, or laugh? No, nothing like that. Yeah. So what I'm keen to do, actually, is um, just to give you a short course of antibiotics and see how you get on. Um, if you've had the similar things in the past and antibiotics have helped, I think that the first step is to see what happens if we do the same thing. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is important or not, but I had a series of, uh, of water problems way back, 25 years ago or so. Um, I had a culpo suspension in 1980-something. I was 50. And that worked. It worked well, I think. Good. OK, let's keep that in mind. But we will start with some treatment. But if it's not improving, we'll need to reassess the bladder function a bit more closely. Ah, uh -huh, right. OK. Are you allergic to any medications as far as you know? Uh, yes, there's a few. Um, septrin, amoxil and... Oh, what's the other one? Oh, um... If you can just hold two seconds, I'll, I'll tell you. Keep it written down so that I can... Um... So, septrin, amoxyl, and trimethoprim. Trimethoprim. Glad I knew that, because that would have been my first choice. 
uh, you've had something called nitrofurantoin? Yes, I've been okay with that one. The nitrofurantoin, I've had it for before for five days. Right, thank you. So, as you asked for, I will get you to provide us with a sample we can send to the lab. I think that what I want you to do is drop back in and see us in five days, and we can review the results and discuss how the medicine is working, OK? You will hear part of a consultation between a doctor and a patient called Mrs Chambers. For questions... You will hear part of a consultation between a doctor and a patient called Mrs Chambers. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Hello, Mrs. Chambers. I am Dr. Bakari, one of the obstetricians working here at the hospital. I've just come to ask you a few questions. What is the reason you came into hospital today? Oh, well, I started bleeding. Oh, I see. Uh, when did you start bleeding? I had a bleed on last Sunday. Okay. And how many weeks pregnant are you at the moment? I'm 36 today, and I started bleeding about a week ago. And did you have any bleeding before that? Actually, yeah, I did, in February. Okay, in February. How much bleeding did you have? Was it quite a bit or just spotting? About half a cup full, and I was 28 weeks then. But um, the bleeding only lasted for not long, a couple of hours, then it stopped. Okay, and when it started last Sunday, how long did it last then? Um, it lasted for about three hours, but then I'm spotting and having some old blood coming out now. Yeah, and it was quite a bit of blood. I would say about a cup full. A cup, okay. And with this episode, did you have any pain anywhere at all? Um, I just get a tightness in my tummy and I get cramps. And a quite severe pain in the lower abdomen, here, for a bit. But it comes and goes. It started when the bleeding, uh, at the same time as I was bleeding. Okay, and did you have pain at 28 weeks when you had the bleeding then as well? Yeah, yeah. It's just like period pains, cramping. Okay. All right. Uh, any other symptoms at all? No, not really. Okay. And with this pregnancy, other than the bleeding, have you had any other problems? No. Okay. And have you had a scan since this bleeding started? Yes. I had one when I was 34 weeks. And um, they found the placenta was low, but I haven't had another one since. Okay. And when is your next scan due? I haven't got another one now. Okay. All right. And when you had your booking scan at 12 weeks, everything was normal then? Well, in my first scan, um, they struggled at 12 weeks to find it. So that was sort of like an internal scan, but they just said it was because it was a small baby or something. But other than that, everything was normal, I think. My visit at the antenatal clinic, everything was normal. I remember my Down's risk was low. Okay. So everything was fine. That's good to hear. All right. Uh, have you had any previous pregnancies? Yeah, I've got two little boys. They're two now. Both very healthy, just a bit naughty. All right. Uh, are they twins? Oh, yes. Sorry, they're twins. And was it a normal delivery or was it by cesarean section? No, normal. Normal delivery, no instruments used, nothing like that? And you didn't have to go into the intensive care unit or neonatal unit, nothing like that? No. Okay, all right. I think I'm starting to get a good picture. Uh, tell me, have you ever had any uterine surgery or procedures? Oh, yes. About four years ago, I had to have an abdominal myomectomy. Oh, I see. That's good to know. Uh, what symptoms did you have with that? It, it was almost exactly two years before my boys were born. I was really suffering. Migraines, body aches, and even a fever with my period. One time the pain got so bad, I had to go in for an MRI. And they found some pretty big fibroids. And at the time, we were struggling to get pregnant, so the doctor suggested I have the fibroids removed. I was really nervous and considered not getting it done, but it seemed to work really well. And two years later, we had our boys. I never really felt any ill effects from the procedure, apart from just taking time to heal. Part B. 
In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a doctor and a nurse reviewing a coma patient. Okay, this patient has been out for some time now. We had quite difficult intracranial pressure control yesterday. We decided not to rock the boat and you can see as a result, he had a low intracranial pressure all day. His circulation has stayed quite stable. Blood pressure's good, heart rate's low. What are his pupils doing? They're quite small. So they're smallish, but not tiny. Is he showing any reflexive responses? No. Has he got a doll's eye? Let's have a look. Okay, is he coughing when you suction? No, he isn't. Not coughing? Okay, um, this indicates that at best, his recovery will probably be incomplete. The worst option is that he will remain in a coma with little responsiveness. You hear a consultant emergency doctor talking to a patient following an accident. You hear a consultant emergency doctor talking to a patient following an accident. Hello, Ellen. Hi, Doc. Can I just take a minute to talk to you about the injuries we found? Sure. So firstly, your neck looks fine, so in a minute I'm going to get this brace off and you'll be able to move your neck. But you've got a fracture of your shoulder blade, a fracture of your thigh bone, a fracture through the tibia and fibula, the lower leg bones, and there are also fractures in your ankle, the talus, your heel bone, and the ankle joint above it, the calcaneus. We were quite worried about the blood flow past the fracture in your thigh, so we did an angiogram and a CT scan and they actually show good blood flow. So with these injuries, you're going to need surgery, and it could be a bit complicated. You hear a clinical researcher introducing a professional development workshop. Welcome to this workshop, Understanding Clinical Research Statistics. My name is Ivan Saxon and I'm going to lead the workshop today. I'm the head of the Acute Care Surgery Unit. It's an academic unit in the Department of Surgery. This course is not the mathematics of statistics though. I believe that a first contact with medical statistics should lead you to an intuitive understanding of the ideas behind the numbers. It should leave you with a deep sense of understanding what is meant by the numbers and techniques mentioned in the methods and results sections of published research papers. In order to critically evaluate research, you should be able to read more than just the introduction and conclusion sections of a paper. Quickly scanning for some significant p-value isn't enough. The patient population trusts you to be properly informed when you manage their health, so that's why we're here. You hear an emergency ward doctor directing her team while treating an accident victim. Okay, let's get on with the primary survey. It's a serious injury to his left leg. It's extremely pale, so blood flow could be an issue. 
But I'm worried about other serious injuries that aren't so obvious. A fracture of the pelvis, abdominal or spinal injuries. I think we better get the consultant emergency surgeon down here too. Okay, so you need to get the lines in, blood off, and we need to remove the rest of his clothing. We're going to want to get some x-rays done before anything else. Chest, pelvis, femur, please. And can somebody get a Doppler, please, so we can check his blood flow in the leg? You hear a doctor speaking to a woman who has presented with heart palpitations. And do you feel short of breath with the palpitations? Uh, yeah, um, and I'm losing my voice too. So you'd just got to work and this happened? Yeah. When's the last time it happened? Uh, a few months ago. Um, I came here as well. Okay, so I'm just going to try and massage the side of your neck here, just to see if that slows down your heart rate. Did they teach you how to try and hold your breath last time? Yes, they did. Did you try that this morning? Yeah, I did. Oh, great. Very good. Okay, well, that massage doesn't seem to be working. Uh, let's try something else. What I want you to do now is to blow as hard as you can into the syringe. Ready? Blow, 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 blow. And stop. Hmm. That doesn't seem to be doing much either. All right, we need to drop that rate, so we better try some meds. You'll need a drip. You hear an emergency paramedic talking to an accident and emergency doctor about a patient who has fallen from his motorcycle. This gentleman's name is Brian. He came off his motorbike at a corner and his leg hit a telephone box. Oh, I see. Looks like he fell pretty hard. Yeah, when we arrived he was sitting up and talking. Uh, GCS 15 and no signs of head injury. Just some pain in his right shoulder. But the main injury is a deformed and angulated right femur, which we've manipulated on the scene. Mm. How's his circulation around the leg? He had a cold avascular right foot at the time and the blood supply seems to have come back post-manipulation. Numbers-wise, he's normal. He's had 150 milligrams of ketamine and a total of 8 milligrams of morphine as well. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. You hear a specialist in medical ethics called Anna Capstan giving a presentation on the issue of burnout in the medical profession. Hi, I'm Anna Capstan from the Division of Medical Ethics at University College. Today I want to discuss the quite urgent topic of burnout among medical professionals as it's becoming. It's kind of an epidemic, but I really think that we're not talking about this enough. That's why we're here today, to get a bit of information out there and start a conversation. 
So what is it? Well, burnout is a psychological and behavioral syndrome. Emotional exhaustion is one quite common hallmark of burnout. It's been defined as long-term, unresolvable job stress, a sense of being overwhelmed and depersonalized and lacking a sense of personal accomplishment. A recent study from the Mayo Clinic showed that in 2011, 45.5% of doctors reported that they felt burned out. And that number has now risen to 54.4% in 2014. More than half of all doctors in this country are saying, I really feel that some aspect of my work as a doctor is making me feel burned out. This is really trouble. It's trouble because a doctor who feels this way can commit more errors. They suffer from compassion fatigue or just not being able to empathize with others because they have their own emotional issues. They may retire early, therefore reducing the workforce. They may have problems managing their own lives. 400 doctors committed suicide last year, which is double the rate of the population average. There's trouble for patients in having a workforce that's burned out. There's trouble for doctors in terms of their own health and well-being. We don't talk about it much. We like to think that doctors can handle everything, but it's clearly not true. It's a problem and there ought to be some solutions. One type of fix is to make sure that hospitals and other healthcare environments try to create better conditions for a happy workforce and for happier doctors. This might include yoga, mindfulness training, having more therapists to talk to, encouraging people to come forward when they feel this way, peer groups and better mentoring. There are a lot of tactics that we could pursue and try to engage in. I'm not sure what's best, and maybe one size does not fit all, but it's time to really build a safety net so that we can keep our workforce functioning and we keep physicians at their careers and doing a good job, not making mistakes, not being indifferent to patients and not harming themselves. This really is a problem and we've got to attend to it in the workplace. It's just as important as any other aspect of workforce safety. When we institute new software or when we have new bureaucratic regulations, I think somebody ought to ask, what does this do to the workforce? If one more doctor complains to me about EPIC and other types of electronic record keeping and billing forms, it'll be one doctor too many. It takes a lot of energy, makes a lot of people unhappy. A lot of the software and computer assistance that's out there doesn't seem to help the doctor. It makes more work or makes them feel frustrated. It also seems to me that if you look at what's going on with respect to regulations and administrative or bureaucratic requirements, nobody is saying, hey, is this user-friendly? What's the burden that it's putting on the doctor? It's just done to save money or allow people to collect bills more reliably, but it's not asking what it's taking out of our workforce. I believe that morally, we've got to make sure that a highly trained workforce that takes a very long time to get the ability to practice medicine is a resource that we preserve and really take seriously. I don't think we're doing that as part of employee or workplace safety. I think it's crucial, but it's being ignored. We also have to view it as part of patient safety. And I think we should start spending some resources to figure out how we can make the physician workplace more user-friendly. How can we make it a happier place to be? What can we do to institute regulations, guidelines, software and bureaucracy to try it out on the workforce for a while to make sure that they're satisfied and that it's not making their lives more miserable? You hear a specialist in health and nutrition called Dr. Gregor McGregor discussing the ideal healthy diet. You hear a specialist in health and nutrition called Dr. Gregor McGregor discussing the ideal healthy diet for humans.
Good evening. I'm Dr. Gregor McGregor. In this talk, I want to discuss what we know about a healthy diet and confront some of the misinformation that gets passed around about what types of food are better or worse for us. So let's get right to it. What is the healthiest diet? Well, the best available balance of evidence suggests that the healthiest diet is one centered around fruits, vegetables, legumes or beans, split peas, chickpeas and lentils, whole grains and nuts. Basically, real food that grows out of the ground. This is our healthiest choice. And all the while minimizing our intake of meat, eggs, dairy and processed junk. So plant-based. A plant-based diet centered around whole plant foods. That's the secret. But of course, it isn't really a secret, and I don't think anyone listening will be surprised to hear this. So what's the issue here? Why is there so much debate around this issue when the evidence seems so clear? A part of the problem, seems to me, is diets, and what might be called the dieting industry. I mean, diets, by definition, don't work, right? Because you go on them, then you go off. What we need is a lifestyle. What we need is a way to eat and live so that we can live a long, healthy life. And to do that, thankfully, the same diet that's associated with longevity is the same diet that's so effective in controlling weight. But there's so much discussion out there online about what's better or worse to eat. There's a lot of conflicting information out there backing up different sides. For example, there is information saying meat is good for you, eggs are good for you, dairy is good for you. And it's really confusing people, because it seems to be like no matter what you believe in, you'll find the proof to back it up. But of course, the proof that meat is good for you is backed up by the meat industry, right? That eggs are good for us, backed up by the egg industry. I mean, this is a classic kind of tobacco industry tactic. The tobacco industry really pioneered the tactics that different interest groups in the food industry use all the time now. The tobacco industry was the first to use science against itself. This was one of their great innovations. This is, you know, in the 1940s and 50s. Basically, they realized that science was venerated, as it should be, as a way of, to kind of sift through what is true and what's not. And the public believed that. And when there was this tremendous body of literature starting in the 1930s and certainly around the 1950s, that, you know, non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer risk than smokers. I mean, by the time the U.S. Surgeon General's report in the 1960s, uh, 1964, came out, they had 7,000 studies, all showing in some way the health risks associated with smoking. So you'd think that after the first few thousand research studies came out, somebody in the government would do something about it, right? But tobacco was a very powerful industry. I mean, it took that much, that overwhelming mass of evidence, to finally get the powers that be to just recognize that smoking was killing people. And the tobacco industry tactic was to fund their own science. They have this tobacco institute where they fund their own scientists just to instill doubt. They knew they couldn't go up against 7,000 studies. In fact, there's a famous tobacco industry memo called Doubt is Our Product. And this was a PR company saying, all we have to do is introduce enough doubt. You know, some scientists say tobacco is good, some say it's bad, so who knows? And so the food industry is the same. The hope is that all the contradictory evidence and confusion makes people just kind of throw up their hands in the air and eat whatever is put in front of them. So this is good for the trillion dollar food industry, but it's not good for our health and well-being. And we do have a lot of evidence suggesting diets heavy in meat and dairy are not very good for you. The most powerful data we have are these interventional studies. For example, you look at the longest, healthiest living populations around the world, the so-called blue zones, with the most centenarians, people living over a hundred, you know, whether it's Okinawa in Japan, Seventh-day Adventists in the USA, or Nicoya in Costa Rica. If you do a Venn diagram of all these blue zones, what they share in common is a plant-based diet, and specifically legumes. For example, Okinawa, the second longest living population in the world, they have a 97% plant-based diet. 